House will come back to order. House will come back to order. I'm going to ask the clerk to ring the bell. The clerk will read the caption to a group of privileged resolutions. The clerk will read. The following nine invite resolutions will be read and referred to the Committee on Rules. Commanding Conservation Corporal Michael Crawley for his dedication and service to the citizens of Georgia. Commanding the Jefferson High School Air Force Junior ROTC cadets and inviting them to be recognized by the House. Recognizing and commending Burt Williams on being selected as the 2013 American Community College Football Coaches Association's Coach of the Year. Recognizing and commending the Baldwin County Bar Association inviting members to be recognized by the House. Recognizing and commending Houston County Sheriff Cullen Talton for his service to the state of Georgia inviting him to be recognized by the House. Congratulating the University of Georgia Extension on the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Smith Lever Act and inviting them to be recognized by the House. Commending Cole Simmons and inviting him to be recognized by the House. Recognizing the Medical College of Georgia, Georgia Regents University, this state's only public medical school and the founding college of Georgia Regents University. And inviting the representatives of the Medical College of Georgia, Georgia Regents University be recognized by the House. Commending the Milton High School baseball team on its numerous accomplishments and inviting the team to be recognized by the House. Recognizing February 11, 2014 as Girl Scout Day at the State Capitol. Commending Nettie Mae Fletcher McLeod. Recognizing and commending Amy Oates Rannell and Drew Ridgely. Recognizing Family and Consumer Sciences. Honoring the life and memory of Reverend Jamal Jacory Williams. Recognizing and commending the Archer High School wrestling team on winning the state championship. Commemorating the year 2014 as the 60th anniversary of the additional phrase of under God to the Pledge of Allegiance. Recognizing and commending the Junior League of Atlanta Incorporated. Recognizing Freddie and Mary Young. Commending and recognizing Thomas M. Lowe, Jr. Commending Dr. Miley May Hemphill. Recognizing the importance of oral health as part of the overall health, supporting efforts to improve the oral health of all in Georgia, and recognizing February as Oral Health Awareness Month. Recognizing and commending Barrow County on its 100th year anniversary. Honoring the life and memory of Willie Beatrice Lang Miller. Honoring the life and memory of Dr. Thomas N. Lumsden. Expressing cultural, economic, and educational cooperation with Hungary and recognizing February 1st, 2014 as Hungry Day at the State Capitol. That completes the reading of privilege resolutions. This house will be in order. House will come to order. Is there any objection to adopting the Privilege resolutions. Chair hears none. The resolutions are adopted. All right, we're about to take up some business that may be of interest to you.
Clerk will read the caption to a resolution. Clerk will read. House Resolution 1304 by Representative Neal of the 146 relative to adjournment and for other purposes. Chair recognizes the majority leader to speak to the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of the House, uh, could I ask the clerk if you would uh, put up the resolution and that might just save me reading the salient parts of it. I don't know about y'all, but I sure have learned in the last 24 to 48 hours that this predicting weather is not a perfect science. Beginning with paragraph 13, or excuse me, line 13, if we could scan that up. The, the, our old resolution is 7 through 12. We were going to be here today, tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday. We were to be in adjournment Friday, Valentine's Day, and then on Monday, President's Day. That's the adjournment resolution that we currently adopted in this House and the Senate, and that's what we're currently working on. The, the, the modification or the amendment of that resolution is on line 13 through 22 primarily and then subsequently line 27 through 29 as it relates to times of convening. But in, in very simplistic terms, what, what 13 through 22 does as weather develops and the state of emergency gets either more acute or less acute, as, as far as conditions are concerned and people's ability to get to and from here safely, uh, we, we will empower the Speaker of the House and the President uh, pro tem, I guess that is President of the Senate, which would be Lieutenant Governor uh, Cagle, to adjourn this House and the Senate concurrently uh, for those periods of time that we all could not get here and notify all of us. The purpose of that is that we will not be, the term you hear is burning days for the, for, for if, if we have to be out like we were two weeks ago, we actually lost those two days. Now I realize that because of the localization of potential conditions, meaning that we're going to have probably far more severe conditions to our roads and transportation system to the north than we are the metro area and to the south, that's going to that's going to pose a lot more burdens on the people that live north of Atlanta, uh, or or about a line through Atlanta going north than it is south. But the good news, I, I suppose, if there is any weather-wise, is that all the way through the day tomorrow, currently forecasted, unless it's changed since I came in here ten minutes ago, on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, the air temp never gets below 36 degrees even though the forecast calls for a possibility of snow or ice. Uh, it's not likely that tomorrow is, is it, uh, it, it, its prediction is improving each day as we deal with it. This we feel like is the most responsible way for us to deal with this and deal with the safety of everybody concerned. And even though we are under a declared state of emergency by the governor, there are, there are no current plans right now to close down state government tomorrow yet. But the forecast as we know them now, and it, that changes rapidly sometimes, is that late Tuesday night, early Thursday morning is the real, real winter storm warning that, that uh, there's a strong likelihood that we're going to have some significant accumulations even here in Atlanta and even in South Georgia. So. Uh, I, d I don't suspect that, uh, but I have no way to know uh, that uh, we'll be able to get here Wednesday and then maybe even Thursday morning, even though Thursday's forecast is a significant uh, temperature increase by noontime and hopefully clean up and thawing. So I'll be happy to yield any questions. Uh, if anybody has any, otherwise I would ask you to support this resolution where we can, or we can basically uh, respond to the conditions as, as they change and only the good Lord knows what they're going to be ahead of time from now minute to minute. You have a question if you care to yield. 
I'd be happy to, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Dudgeon to your right for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Leader. Do you yield? Absolutely. Um, is the intention that we're gone Friday and Monday no matter what? In other words, to say we miss Wednesday and Thursday is, is an option to make them up, so to speak, on Friday and Monday? The current intention, the uh, current resolution has us being out Friday and Monday. Uh, there is a chance, depending on conditions and what happens and what days we may lose to more efficiently be able to carry out our duties here, that I may come back to you with another resolution and maybe use one or maybe both of the, I doubt both of those days, but maybe one of those two days as a way to, 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 to make up a day and move forward. Because Thank you. This catches us at a real precarious time because we're right in the middle of completion of our budget deliberations after hundreds of hours of hard work on that and makes planning all those matters very difficult. You have another question if you care to yield. I'll be happy to. Chair recognizes Representative Sims to your left for a question. Yes, sir, I'd be glad to yield. Mr. Leader, will you yield? Um, the, as far as this folks from South Georgia, we've got a long way to go. Um, do you know, I know tomorrow is not considered a day, but can we kind of know on Wednesday, so if we're going to, as we say now, South, bug out of here, what, can you give us a little notice on what about Wednesday schedule, a little bit? Of, have you had anything about Wednesday and Thursday? I, I, I understand that there's still a weather report out there, but we've got to check out our hotels and, all, and, and different places and try to get south. I understand that. I hope we'll have a – thank you for that question, and I should have covered that, and I appreciate you asking that question. I hope we'll have an update on, on that by the end of the day today as I understand the deliberations as they move forward with the forecasters and, and the people on the winter storm team so that you all can play that. It is our goal and the speaker's goal here to give you as much advance notice as humanly possible given, given a lot of variables here. And the second we think it's not safe to be here, uh, hopefully we will have told you that long before so that you can make your plans accordingly. And especially those of you that rent hotel rooms, if you need to let them know we know you need to let them know by either 11 o'clock in the morning or noon each day, so we'll certainly have an update on that. But if I had to call it right now from the forecast I have seen, my own personal opinion, not binding anybody else in leadership, Wednesday looks like there's a very slight chance that we would be able to be here. That The forecast is, is pretty severe on Wednesday, late Tuesday night and Wednesday. We're talking about ice, sleet, and snow was significant accumulation. So if I had to call that this second, I'd say plan on not being here Wednesday, but uh, but we, we, we won't know. And we'll know more by the end of the day, and that's where we think we have that much time at least. Like I say, the folks going north, if we didn't make up, their, their winter storm watch actually starts at 7 o'clock this evening. So asking them to wait is, is especially hard because uh, if they do decide that they go home, they won't be able to get home. It'll be too late for them to travel north, even though travel in the Atlanta area will be fine for us going to and from session. So I, I, I feel especially sorry for the folks that would have to drive north because they would be going into more severe conditions. But at any rate, I think this is the best we can do with what we have right now, and uh, I hope we'll have uh, an update to you either here if we're still in the house, but certainly we're in contact with all you all by email every day, and I'll certainly be in contact with a minority leader as well as plans as plans go on. And uh, and I'm open for any reasonable suggestions too. Uh, but with that, Mr. Speaker, I ask for your favorable consideration of this uh, resolution, and I'll yield the well. Thank you, Mr. Leader. And uh, before you vote, I want to. Tell the members of the House that this resolution is based on the most recent information that we have on the forecast for tomorrow, which is a little better for tomorrow than we originally had thought, and so that's why we're, um, that's part of the reason we're doing this. The Chair is aware that there are all kinds of, of issues. I know that People are in hotels, as the member pointed out, downtown and around the city. The chair is also aware that we have a number of members who drive in from the um, 
um, other parts of the metro area, um, including the north metro area. And so I'm going to weigh all of that as we um, go through the afternoon and the evening. My first consideration will be for safety of the members of this body and our staff. Uh, we're also doing it this way, though, to avoid burning days um, because, as the leader pointed out, we are today halfway through this session. And it is a, a, a sort of a critical juncture in terms of our time, and so we're seeking to avoid that. It wasn't too much of a factor a couple of weeks ago. It is, a, uh, as they say in football, the clock is becoming a little bit of a factor now. And so that's why we're guarding that. All those in favor of the adoption of House Resolution 1304 will vote aye, those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the adoption of House Resolution 1304. The ayes are 164, the nays are zero. This resolution, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore adopted. For what purpose does the majority leader of this house rise? Mr. Speaker, to make a motion for state your motion. Immediate transmittal of House Resolution 1304 to the Senate. The majority leader has moved that House Resolution 1304 be immediately transmitted to the Senate. Is there objection? The chair hears none and it is on its way across the hall. Chair recognizes the chairman of the Appropriations Committee for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As uh, we've all been watching the weather situation, trying to figure out what we need to do best to get folks in and out safely, I want to announce one change in meeting schedule that affects tomorrow. The full Appropriations Committee meeting for tomorrow at 2 o'clock has been changed to tomorrow morning at 7.30 a.m., still in room 341. Subcommittees will be meeting this afternoon uh, in the order which they were posted to start at 1.30, but they will meet upon adjournment, still in the same order, and some of those will not take the entire 30 minutes to go through, so they'll just try to catch up time as they can go along. Uh, we'll let you know that we have excused the agencies that are having to deal with any emergency planning today from being here this afternoon because they need to be concentrating their efforts on preparations for the storm, so they have been excused as well. So that's all I've got, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Chair recognizes the chairman of the majority caucus, Chairman Hatchett, for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In consideration of everything that's been said that you already heard, our caucus meeting that was scheduled for tomorrow at 8, that's the majority caucus that was scheduled at 8 for tomorrow. It's canceled till further notice. Thank you. Okay, now we're going back to the rules calendar. You've got a little bit of um, um, ability to plan, at least for, for the rest of today and this evening, maybe. Uh, chair recognizes Representative Flood for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, likewise, the House Democratic Caucus will not be meeting tomorrow morning either. It's canceled. The meeting and the meeting at uh, four fifteen is canceled this afternoon for the whips. Chair recognizes. Now we will have other announce. We'll have come back for announcements at the end of the rules calendar. But some of these you might want to know about now. Chairman uh, Chair recognizes the chairman of the House Rules Committee, Chairman Meadows, for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In light of what you've just heard from Mr. Uh, Appropriations Chairman, 
there will be a rules committee meeting in the morning at nine o'clock. Now we're going on back to the rules calendar. Going back to the rules calendar, remind you that we have committees that have scheduled meetings this afternoon, but we're going to finish the rules calendar. The clerk will read the caption to House Bill 719. House Bill 719. House Bill 719 by Representative Tanner of the Ninth to amend Article 2 of Chapter 8 of Title 48 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to the Joint County Municipal Sales and Use Tax. This bill having been before the Committee on Ways and Means, the Committee recommends the same due pass and be read for the third time. Chair recognizes Representative Tanner to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I um, want to just kind of briefly go over what this bill uh, does. It uh, seems more complicated maybe than it is, but uh, those of us who have worked in local government for uh, several years have had the unpleasant experience many times of negotiating loss between counties and cities. Uh, lost, as we commonly refer to it, is the one penny local option sales tax that most of our counties and cities across the state uh, collect and utilize uh, to run local government. The law requires every 10 years after the 10-year census that counties and cities get together and negotiate how that uh, split will be done, how that lost money will be distributed. A few years ago, uh, this body made some changes to how that decision was reached. Uh, under this new law, counties and cities would first of all get together and attempt to come to a negotiated agreement. Uh, if they could not come to a negotiated agreement on the split of that money, they would then uh, have the opportunity to go to non-binding mediation. Uh, if they were then unable to reach an agreement, they could then uh, go or would go to baseball arbitration. Uh, baseball arbitration is where they would appear before a superior court judge and the county would present their case and say, Your Honor, we believe that the split should be, for an example, 80-20. The county should get 80 percent, the county would get 20 percent. Uh, the city then would present their case and they would put their proposal forth. For an example, the city should get 50 percent and the county should get 50 percent. They then, the judge would then be bound to accept one or the other. He couldn't split the baby, so to speak. He would just do one or the other. In October of this last year, Georgia, the Georgia Supreme Court ruled that the concept of baseball arbitration uh, was unconstitutional because it shifted the uh, burden of taxation or the power of taxation from the legislative branch to the judicial branch. About th there was 35 counties and cities affected by this decision. As you can imagine, many of them went into panic mode and through the involvement of ACCG, GMA, the Attorney General's Office and the Commissioner of the Department of Revenue, it was determined by the Commissioner of the Department of Revenue that he would accept a distribution certificate from these 35 counties and cities as long as it was consented to by all parties and is received prior to the court, the court decision being final on October 18th. All 35 counties and cities were able to comply with that and at the direction of leadership in this body, a group of legislators uh, worked with ACCG and GMA, including Chairman Willard, Chairman Burns, Chairman Jay Powell, Representative Barry Fleming, Representative Andy Welch, and myself and others. Uh, and we. I'm honored today to stand before you on behalf of this group and the bill that's before you simply states that any distribution certificate consented to by all the parties, the county and the cities, and submitted to the Commissioner of the Department of Revenue between June 4th, 2010 and October 18th, 2013 uh, shall be valid. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I would ask for this body's favorable consideration to House Bill 719. You don't appear to have any questions. Chair has a question for yes, you, though. Yes, sir, Mr. Speaker. Is it true today's your birthday? <clears throat> that, that's my understanding, yes, sir. So are you asking the, this House to pass this bill as sort of a birthday present to you? I have some other bills, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to reserve that for. <laughs> <laughs> I yield the well. Gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. 
Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of House Bill 719 will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. And the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of House Bill 719. The ayes are 170, the nays are zero. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Chair wants to recognize on the floor of the House a former member of this body. Now a distinguished member of the judiciary, Judge Lawton Stevens of the Superior Court in the Western Judicial Circuit from Athens, Clark County. Judge Stevens, thank you. <laughs> Clerk will read the caption to House Bill 837, House Bill 837. House Bill 837 by Representative Hamilton of the 24th to amend Article 6 of Chapter 8 of Title 42 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotated relating to agreements for probation services. This bill having come before the Committee on Public Safety and Homeland Security, the Committee recommends the same do pass by Committee Substitute and be read for the third time. House Bill 837 was uh, postponed on the last legislative day to today's calendar and pursuant to House Rule 33.3, the House Rules Committee has limited debate to not longer than 60 minutes. The chair will allocate 30 minutes to each side. Chair is of the understanding all amendments are now in and so we're good on that issue. Chair recognizes Chairman Hamilton to present the bill. Chairman Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can assure you this will be a lot shorter than last time. I bring before you uh, House Bill 837. Let me tell you all this bill does. All this bill does is it ensures that probation continues as a viable alternative to incarceration in this state. Richmond County's suit that called it just jeopardizes that whole system and the ability to utilize that. There's no change in policy. This is a status quo bill. It simply takes the section that was with pro, which was with uh, felony and brings it over misdemeanor. That's all this bill does. It's been vetted by all the judicial uh, groups out there in the state, and I would urge for you to. Uh, pass this bill as is. There will be some amendments, and uh, we'll talk about those amendments. Uh, I want to ap I appreciate the minority leader. She has talked to me on all four of these amendments and um, has been very straightforward on that. And uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, that's all I have to say about this bill. If, uh, uh, let, me, let me tell you about the amendments. The, uh, there are four. The first, if you use the order, AM 410011, that's the first one. Um, well, that's not the first one. Let me get in this order. The first one is uh, 0008. Um, this bill, in my opinion, basically shuts down private probation in the state of Georgia. Because what you need to understand is that, uh, or what I have come to understand, is that felony probation is subsidized by taxpayers. Private, the misdemeanor probations are not. They're paid for by the probationers. So in order to keep from shutting down private probation, the, the government is going to have to come up with somewhere between 75 and $150 million to make up that difference. That's what we estimate. So it's a pretty, pretty large tax increase if you want to vote for that amendment. The next amendment is 0011. All she is doing is adding at the end. I will say that this uh, amendment has no real impact on the bill. 
However, you'll see I will vote against this, but but that's our legislative uh, ability to do that. It really, because the only reason I'm going to vote against it is it changes policy. Even if this bill, this amendment passes, I'm still going to vote for the bill. It's just simple change in policy. And my position on that, according to the judges I've spoken with, is that we would then, if we do that, we make misdemeanor tolling different than felony tolling. And the intention is to make it status quo and keep it the same. The next amendment, uh, 0013, um, adds both time and money to the process. I've already heard, for example, from the city of Atlanta. The city of Atlanta, having just seen this amendment today, has already calculated that if this amendment is on that bill, that court system alone, it will cost them an additional $45,000 a year in incremental costs based on the certified mail and uh, in personal service. And so I encourage you to vote no on that. Again, it'd be a very large tax increase. And then the uh, final amendment is an amendment that I, when I originally saw this uh, with the minority leader, I agree with it. We're simply changing a shall to may. However, I'll vote against this amendment because what it really does, what it, what it really does is again, it changes policy. And so my intention is to keep the policy the same. And with, so with that, that's what those amendments do. And I ask for your favorable consideration. Mr. Speaker, I don't know if there's any questions or not. Uh, you've got a few. I'll, I'll consider one do or two. You, do you yield? Yes. Chair recognizes the chairman of the Higher Education Committee, Chairman Rogers, to your right for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the gentleman yield? Certainly. Is it not true this weekend, in fact, Saturday afternoon from 5 to 6, that I had a meeting with the chief judge of the state court of Hall County and that he is in total agreement with House Bill 837 and asked me to vote yes for it? And I have a letter with the state court judge's signature on it. I believe the gentleman knows of what he speaks. Thank you very much. I'll take one more, Speaker. Chair recognizes the Majority Caucus Whip, Representative Ramsey, to your right for a question. Will the gentleman yield? Certainly. I know there's some confusion on Friday, but, but is it not true that this bill simply ensures that judges have the ability to enforce the terms of misdemeanor probation against offenders who have failed to meet the terms of their obligations under their probation? That's all it does. Will the gentleman further yield? Sure. Is it not further true that the bill makes no other substantive changes to the rights duties or obligations of private probation companies. That's absolutely correct. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Mr. Speaker, I think the, the body knows what this bill does and doesn't do, and I yield the well. Thank you very much. The gentleman has yielded the well. We have another representative that wished to speak for the bill. Chair recognizes Representative Jackson, Representative Mac Jackson, to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of House Bill 837 today. Uh, I worked as a probation officer for 18 years, and in three of those years, I supervised misdemeanor cases. And a toll order is simply a tool used so that you can supervise a case, because if a probationer abscond, then there's nothing you can do if you can't toll the order. And what the toll order simply does is stop the clock from running on that sentence until you can have time to find a probationer. But before a, a warrant is told, the warrant has been issued and given to the sheriff department to locate that probationer. And after so many days, say 30 days or more, if they can't find him, then you go and ask the judge to toll the order. And the toll order simply says the undersigned officer hereby certifies that a thorough and diligent search for the probationer listed in this warrant an affidavit has been made at but limited to places of abode, known places of frequencies and others, and that probationer whereabouts are unknown and the probationer cannot be located. And then the judge signs the affidavit because you've sworn that you've exhausted all efforts in trying to locate the probationer. Now in misdemeanor cases, in a 12-month case, you have to have this tool in order to supervise a case because misdemeanors only last for 12 months. And if that probationer doesn't report to the office and you can't find him in the field or you can't have a collateral contact on him, then there's no way for you to be able to supervise that case. So without that toll order in place, 
you could just virtually exhaust all efforts and never supervise that case. And after 12 months, that case has already uh, terminated and you haven't collected the fines or restitution or all the monies owed on that case. So this order is very, uh, a very needful tool in supervising misdemeanor cases. Also, some of the municipalities sentenced some misdemeanors to three months, some to six months. And that's, that's a very short time to supervise a case because people can be transit, they can move from one location to the other and not allow the probation officer to see them, whether it's in the field, whether it's in the office, or a collateral contact, some other person that know their whereabouts. So this order is very important because probationers abscond, they leave all the time, and without that toll order in place, there's no way for you to supervise a misdemeanor case. Thank you, and I yield the well. Gentleman has yielded the well. Chair recognizes Representative Sims to speak to the bill. Representative Sims. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House. I come down here in opposition to this, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I'm for some of the amendments, but I want everybody to look on page 7 of the LC number 41073S, and, and on lines 224 through 229. And let me explain to you what this means. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history while you're reading over that about the history of private probation in Georgia. When we first passed this, now most of you, I would say 90% of you were not in the, in the House of Representatives at the time. And what happened was a guy came down here bribing people. A man went to prison for putting this in place. And not only did they go to prison, another person had to turn state's evidence in order to keep from going to prison. And another person was charged with it and had to go to trial that was not guilty at all in any of it because she was an innocent party to all of it. And they tried to put it off on her. And let me tell you what it did. Mr. Murphy, who was here as speaker then, Mr. Coleman, and Mr. Walker, who were all parts of this issue, said it was the greatest tra travesty we'd ever done. It was a mistake and a mess. And I'm going to tell you what it's all about. It's about money, folks. It is about M-O-N-E-Y, dollar sign, dollar sign. And most of these people, I agree, they ma they've made bad mistakes. They have gotten arrested, and I don't have any problem with them paying fines and restitution for what they've done. But what private probation does is they take the first part and they only pay the fine just a little bit. So at the end, these folks are working and working and working trying to pay off the fine and restitution when they should be paying that off first and then private probation gets what's left over. But that's not the way it works. And it's almost as Mr. Harbin has put on your desk, indentured servitude. And they are not doing right. And in this line down here where it says on 229, unpaid fines, restitution, and other monies, look in there. Look in there where it says this. Because that's underlined. That's new law. Other monies. And it means that they're going to Keep charging folks that can't pay for this and do the things that they cannot, they cannot, they can't pay it back. So they end up in prison. So we told it while they're, I say prison, in jail. While they're in jail, we'll toll it. And then when they get out of jail, they still owe it. Then they pick them up again because they didn't pay it. And they go back and back and back and back. And we're still putting them in jail. And it's crazy. Why do they owe money if they're in jail? I can't understand that. We're paying for that, and then they've got to pay back probation. 
And probation's not paying us, the state, what we owe. It's a bad, bad precedent to set. I just cannot go with that. Let me explain to you something else they do. Doesn't have anything to do with the bill and this, and that, but I'll just explain to you. Let's say you've got a, a young son, young daughter that gets in one of these areas of the state that has a $450 fine for 20 miles over the speed limit, plus the super speeder law, plus everything else. So they end up with about an $800 fine. Okay? So we got to pay that back. And, there, and so if you're a good parent, you want them to pay it back and be a good parent and say, you know, good things are good things. And they got to pay this back. Well, if they miss a payment, guess what? They're going to pick them up, put them in jail. Now, if they go down there on Thursday and they're closed and they got the money to pay them and they're not open on Monday, they got that warrant ready for them. I'm guaranteeing you this happens. I've had people call me and they will not transfer it. I guarantee you the folks in, in Athens, Georgia, won't transfer it to Coffee County so they can transfer to another private probation agency. They won't do that because it's a loss of money to them. Not a convenience to the person who's actually willing and able to pay the fine. Ladies and gentlemen, please vote for the amendments. This bill is bad. I, I do not like it. I think Mr. Harbin's little article there that was in the Augusta Chronicle is right. And I uh, generally leave the well. Thank you. Gentleman has yielded the well. All right, that's all the uh, members that had signed up to speak on the bill. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. We have some amendments that we're going to consider. Okay, the first amendment is by the minority leader it is AM four one zero 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 eight. The Abrams Amendment. Does the minority leader wish to be heard before I call for a vote on the amendment? The lady has the right. Chair recognizes the minority leader to speak to the first amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also want to take a moment and thank the speaker for his uh, action on Friday. It is, I think, a strong sign in this body that we can work together even if we may disagree on the outcome. I was I greatly appreciative of the courtesy shown, and so just wanted to take a moment and thank the speaker for that action. Uh, I also wanted to preface this amendment with uh, a very quick anecdote. I, my first major committee here was Judiciary Non-Civil, chaired by then Chairman Ralston, and there was a bill that was offered by John Lunsford. Uh, John, if you know, remember him, was a very colorful character. Uh, but John had a bill, and there were several components to that bill that he, he attempted to fix, uh, but was having some difficulty. So as a lawyer, I sat beside him and helped write several amendments. Uh, we got each of those amendments through, and at the time of the vote, I voted against the bill. And on the other side of the room in judiciary, John 
waved his hands at me, and he said, well, Stacy, that was my bill. And I said, yeah, it's a bad idea, but now at least it's good law. Uh, I believe that HB 837 is bad law, but is a, is a bad idea, but it should at least be good law. And what I want to offer are a series of amendments that will at least make it good law, even if the bad idea moves forward. Uh, so AM 410008 begins the attempt by stating that the rate offered uh, shall not exceed the amount charged for felony probation services by the Department of Corrections. Uh, the chairman stated that it will require a tax increase because the felony amounts are subsidized. That's actually incorrect. It does not require a tax increase because, as an august member of this body pointed out before lunch, the market will drive the fees down if necessary if private probation officers want to stay in business. Um, what this does do, however, is set as a matter of law that misdemeanors should not be more expensive than felonies, that you should not pay more to a probation service for a speeding ticket than you do for a murder. Uh, it also compels the industry to reevaluate its pricing model, but what it does not do is solve the fundamental issue of fees being paid before fines. That is, that the fees, that the monies paid by a probationer go to pay the company before they go to pay the state. This does not solve that, but it incentivizes better behavior, assuming that the free market will work the way we have been taught that it will work. And so I would ask this body's approval of this amendment. You have a question if you care to yield. Certainly. Chair recognizes uh, the Dean of the House, Chairman Smyre, to your left for a question. Uh, to the leader in the well, as it is now, the Department of Correction has a rate. They charge various services based on the offense. Under your amendment, what you're doing is, is are you tying those together? Or exactly. We're setting identical rates, saying that a misdemeanor, the rate for misdemeanors cannot exceed the rates that for felonies. I'll, in, in, in conjunction with that, would it, if, if you didn't have that, would it be a market kind of driven situation? Well, currently as it, as it stands, the market has not only, not only drives, but has driven it up. What I'm stating is that if we align those, then we are using our regulatory powers to align it, but that the market can decide if those probation services want to charge a lower fee or get out of the business of Sounds providing good. probation services. Thank you, ma'am. Chair recognizes the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Chairman Willard, to your right for a question. The question of uh, his, question um, his microphone is not working. Uh, I think his question was, what is the amount that could be charged? Is that right, Mr. Chairman? I'm not aware of the exact number, but what I will say is that the idea is to make certain that we at least create parity. Uh, and certainly that we will not allow a misdemeanor charge to exceed a felony charge. Thank you. Do you yield for another question? I do. Chair recognizes Representative Wilkerson to your left for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the lady yield? I do. So your amendment, just so I'm clear, is simply saying that private industries should not charge more than what we could do it if we did it in-house. Correct. Is that what it's simply saying? Well, uh, correct. And actually, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Do you continue to yield? I do, sir. Chair recognizes the majority leader to your right for a question. Does the lady yield? I do. Uh, a real question. Uh, is there only one felony probation charge, or is there varying amounts charged for the whatever the felony My, might so the question is, is there one charge? My understanding is there is a rate set, and so this would simply say that when we are setting the rates for probation for misdemeanors, that it will, it cannot exceed what is set for felony. But yes, I understand there's a rate schedule that does have a very, has varying fees, depending on the level of services provided. Would you further yield then? Certainly. 
if if there more if there's more than one rate because you use the word rate one time and rates plural the other time, what would be the ceiling uh, and under the terms of your amendment? I mean, which of the rates plural would we use to establish the ceiling that it looks to me like your amendment seeks to establish? The the intent and I appreciate the question from the leader. The intent is to let the Department of Corrections evaluate the rate that it sets. My understanding is that there can be a range of rates. I think actually it actually is a sta there is a stable rate that is charged, but the intent is more the policy, which is that the Department of Corrections will ensure that no rates are charged that are in excess of those charged for felonies. You have other questions. Do you continue to yield? Sir, I, I think we've exhausted this conversation. I'd be happy to um, move to a vote on this bill, on this amendment. So All I right. yield the will. Is there objection to adopting the Abrams Amendment AM 410008? Is there objection? There is objection. Does the lady move? The lady moves. All those in favor of adopting the Abrams Amendment AM 410008 will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. For what purpose does the Majority Caucus whip rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Is it not true this is an apples and oranges comparison because the Department of Corrections probation process is heavily subsidized by taxpayers? versus paid for by offenders. And this is a debate we should have had back years ago when private probation was implemented in the state of Georgia. I am sure that the very able uh, lawyer from Fayetteville knows of which he speaks. What purpose does the minority leader rise? A parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Is it not true that the intent of this amendment is to simply set uh, standard by which the entire state has to operate so that misdemeanors do not run the risk of being asked to pay excessive fees and that is simply the intent of this bill to set a standard that this body can abide by. I'm sure the lady believes that to be true. Okay, all those in favor of the Ab Abrams Amendment will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machines. On the ladies' amendment, the ayes are 84, the nays are 81, the amendment is adopted. Having the second amendment is also by the minority leader. It is AM 410014. Chair recognizes the minority leader to speak to her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this amendment is very simple. Under the current language in the bill, the language says that the running of a probated sentence shall be told. This simply gives discretion back to judges to say that they may toll or they may not. Uh, this eliminates automatic tolling, which means that if you fail to pay a fee, if you fail to meet some parameter, it gives the judge discretion so that we no longer have uh, folks who find themselves in prison simply because the tolling order was mandatory as opposed to being permissive based on the decision of the judge. And I would ask for favorable consideration. Is there objection to the amendment? There is objection. Does the lady move? The lady moves. All those in favor of the adoption of Abrams Amendment AM 410014 will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. And the clerk will unlock the machines.
Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the adoption of the Abrams Amendment, AM 410014. The ayes are 98, the nays are 69. This amendment, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is adopted. The th next amendment is also by the minority leader. It's AM 410011. Chair recognizes the minority leader to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment, if you look at the last two lines, lines five and line six, uh, actually line six is the, the operative language, it simply requires that when a probation officer uh, submits uh, that they have to actually state the efforts that they've made to contact the probationer. This comes about because there have been a number of cases where the probation officer simply says, well, I tried to reach the person, but does not enumerate what actions were taken, such as that they went by the house, that they sent a letter, that they've tried to make contact. And this simply requires as a matter of record that they state all efforts that were, they state the efforts that were made by the probation officer to contact the petitioner. And I, if there are no questions, I will yield the well. You don't have questions. Is there objection to the amendment? Is there objection? Chair hears none. The amendment is adopted. The next amendment is by the minority leader, AM 410013. Chair recognizes the minority leader to speak to her amendment. This final amendment changes the operation of deciding what happens uh, when, when, a toll, when a sentence is told. Essentially, it requires a hearing before a judge before tolling occurs. Uh, there was the comment made earlier by the chairman in his presentation that this could cost, for example, the city of Atlanta $44,000. Uh, I, I would point out that for the city of Atlanta, they consider 850 cases uh, of this type every year. This is an extraordinary number. It is the upper bound. It is not the norm. Uh, but more than that, I think $44,000 to provide adequate notice should be balanced against the loss of liberty for someone who is being sent to prison for a year simply because they couldn't pay a traffic fine. Um, if we do not adopt this amendment, a probation officer can tell a judge that he's done everything and the probationer really has no forum to argue back. So what this says is that a rule nisi has to happen, meaning that you have to go before the judge, the probation officer has to explain what he has done, and the probationer has to explain what she has done. If the judge then finds the conversation to be compelling, for example, that you simply couldn't meet the fees or that you thought you were paying, but the monies were applied to the fees and not the fine, then it gives the judge the discretion to make a determination rather than simply having only the side of the probation officer brought before the court. Um, I find that this is very simplistic and straightforward, and in fact, I spoke with the chief judge uh, who raised the concern about the 44,000, and this is exactly the process that they follow. He strongly supports the due process that's embedded in this, even though there, there may be concern about the fees, and I would ask for the favorable consideration of this body. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to take questions. You have a couple of questions. The chair recognizes, do you yield? I do. Chair recognizes Chairman Hamilton to your right for a question. Does the lady yield? I do. When we originally discussed this, is it not true that I believe and most of the judges that I've spoken with in this state believe that if this amendment passes, that we're gonna add a cost as well as a time to a process that right now already takes approximately 90 days to implement? We did discuss that. I would point out, however, that the cost that we're incurring is whether we charge for $6.49 to send a letter or we charge $85 a day to put someone in jail. And I would argue that the cost is actually lower to follow the process of rural NISI and allowing someone to come before the body than it is to try to handle this later on by having to increase the amount of money we put into the general fund to pay for our services in the prison. Would, would the lady further yield, please? Certainly. Does it not also say that the reason that this is happening is because the person has absconded, which means that they cannot be found, and that yet, even though they cannot be found, 
We're now going to turn around and take up additional time and money trying to find them through certified mail. I, again, I would say that the issue is not one of how much time it takes or even the amount, but whether we're affording due process. What this process requires is that a judge, when a probation officer decides that they require tolling, they have to go before the court. What I'm simply requesting is that when they go before the court, that the court afford the person who will find themselves to be incarcerated potentially, that they be afforded the opportunity to also address the court. If we do that, I do not believe it will extend the time, but I will argue that it does extend due process, and that should be the ultimate goal of this body. The nominal cost of $6.49 to send a letter, I think, should be balanced against the long-term cost of incarcerating our citizens simply for failure to pay a fine. Do you yield for further questions? I do. Chair recognizes the governor's floor leader, Representative Coomer, to your right for a question. Thank you, Speaker. The gentlelady yield. I do. Thank you. It's not true that I voted in favor of your first two amendments you presented here. I appreciate that. And uh, I want to ask you, when uh, probation, when a person's on probation, aren't they required to keep a probation officer informed of their current address while they're on probation? They are. And so the provision in the previous amendment that was not objected to, that uh, 410011, which requires the probation officer to submit an affidavit stating uh, what he's done or what she has done to find the absconding probationer would satisfy, uh, or should satisfy most judges uh, that a reasonable effort's been made to find the person before asking for any other relief like tolling or, or a warrant, shouldn't it? In, I think your, your point would be that the probationer is given the opportunity to state with definitive nature what they've done. The issues are two that this tries to address. The first is that the probation officer may or may not provide accurate information, and so this gives the probation, the probationer, the, uh, basically the ability to disagree in a court, to tell the judge that even though they said they came to my house, no one showed up or I didn't get notice. Because there are occasions where the probation officers, certainly not anyone in this body, but there are probation officers who do not provide complete information. And while the affidavit is important, the affidavit simply provides a baseline, a threshold for truthfulness. But this NISI ruling, this NISI hearing will pr provide opportunity for actually investigating the, the truth of what the probation officer said. But the second part, and the most important part, is that tolling doesn't simply happen for absconders. It happens when there is, an at, at, when there is a request to toll. The request can be made for a variety of reasons. If the person has truly absconded, they will not show up for the hearing, in which case the court has satisfied its burden and that person should have a warrant issued for his or her arrest. But in the event that there is a more complicated story, we should provide an opportunity for a misdemeanant to approach the court and explain what the situation is, and that's all this asks for. And in fact, this is operational in the court in, in Atlanta already, and I'm simply asking that this good practice be extended to other courts in the state. Will you further yield? Certainly. Just as to your first point on the uh, filing of a false affidavit, is that not already a crime in Georgia law? It, it is a crime, but it's a crime that has to be proven. And how will we have proof unless the probationer who's, being, who's basically being told that these were the efforts take, taken has the ability to say, well, actually, that's not true. And in fact, this does create the this creates the evidentiary, uh, the evidence necessary to prove that the crime actually existed, and the hearing will provide the form for that determination. Thank you very much. Do you, <clears throat> excuse me, do you further yield? I do. Chair recognizes the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Chairman Willard, to your right for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To my friend in the well, uh, Ms. Abrams, is, is this not to give the personal pro probation opportunity to appear before a magistrate and explain whatever calls they have for failure to be able to pay the fine if they're unemployed, don't have the funds for it, uh, probation fees, or whatever may be the cost that have accumulated? Absolutely, sir. Is it not also true that the Supreme Court of this country has ruled that people who are paupers or failure to be able to pay a fine is not cause for them to be locked up in jail? Correct, sir. Thank you. Do you further yield? I do. Chair recognizes Representative Sims to your left for a question. Does the lady yield? I do. Is it not true that 
if the judge wanted to, they could charge the individual the 649 for the for the uh, registered mail if they fi were found to have to in in violation of any of their probation. Is that not true? I, I believe it is possible for the court to recoup the cost. They could recoup. Isn't it also true that most of these people that are on private probation are not visited by probation officers, but have to go to the office in which they, uh, whichever private probation company they may be dealing with at that point in time, don't aren't they sh to show up? And if they happen to be closed or whatever, without giving notice, they could be given a warrant and all these things can happen to them and be locked up, even though they didn't have the money or whatever. Isn't that not true? That is true. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I believe that I have fully explained the, the amendment. I would ask the body's favorable consideration. I yield the well. The lady has yielded the well. On the adoption of the Abrams Amendment, AM 410013, is there objection? Is there objection? There is objection. Does the lady move? The lady moves. All those in favor of the adoption of the Abrams Amendment AM 410013 will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine. What purpose does Representative Smyre rise? It's a little late. I, was, I had a question for the leader, and, and uh, she yielded the well. She yielded the well. Clerk will ring the bell. <laughs> Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the adoption of the Abrams Amendment, AM 410013, the ayes are 97, the nays are 72, and the amendment is adopted. We had the last 20 minutes. What purpose does the majority leader rise? Motion to table. Majority leader moves that House Bill 837 be placed on the table. All those in favor of the motion will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine. On the majority leader's motion that House Bill 837 be placed on the table, the ayes are 108, the nays are 60, and it resides on the table. Clerk will read the caption to House Bill 741. House Bill 741. House Bill 741 by Representative Tanner of the Ninth to amend Chapter 5 of Title 12 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotator relating to water resources. This bill having come before the Committee on Natural Resources and Environment, the Committee recommends that the same do pass by Committee Substitute and be read for the third time. Chair recognizes, just a moment. This house will be in order. The house will be in order. We've still got a proposition on the rules calendar. Chair recognizes Representative Tanner to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I come before you today to ask your favorable consideration for House Bill 741. This bill would empower local uh, governments and local citizens to have a uh, larger voice in the issuance of land application sludge permits in their community. Currently, an individual who applies for one of these permits does so through the EPD director, who then determines whether or not to grant it based on EPD regulations. The local city or county currently has no authority in the current process. House Bill 741 would ensure that where the sludge would be placed complies with local zoning and or land use ordinances, 
prior to the permit being considered by EPD. It also requires that any hearing that's going to be held on the issuance of that permit be held within the jurisdiction where the sludge would be placed. This is currently not the practice. Over the past nine months, I've worked closely with EPD, ACCG, and GMA on this bill, and I'm pleased to be able to report to you as I stand before you today that all of them support and endorse the bill, including EPD. I have also received favorable comments from members of this industry, and no one spoke against or in opposition of the bill in subcommittee or in committee on natural resources. Mr. Speaker, with that, I would be glad to answer any questions, and I would uh, ask for favorable You have comments. no questions. Thank you. I yield the well. Gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of House Bill 741 will vote aye. Those opposed to vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of House Bill 741. The ayes are 161, the nays are one. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. All right. All right, we've got a couple of motions, and then if you have an announcement that you, and you haven't signed up, you need to get with a messenger right now. What purpose does the Chairman of the Agriculture and Consumer Affairs Committee, Chairman McCall, rise? Make a motion, Mr. Speaker. State your motion. Make a motion that the rule be temporarily suspended so that a bill can be read, first read, and assigned to a committee, please, sir. Clerk will read the caption. House Bill to amend Article 1 of Chapter 8 of Title 48 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotator relating to general provisions relative to state sales and use tax. On the gentleman's motion that the rules of this House be temporarily suspended to allow a bill to be read for the first time and assigned to committee, is there objection? The chair hears none. It is so ordered. Ways and means. What purpose does Chairman Stevens rise? Make a motion, Mr. Speaker. State your motion. Mr. Speaker, I move this House temporarily suspend its rules so that a bill can be read the first time and assigned to committee. Clerk will read the caption. House Bill by Stevens of the 164th to amend Chapter 7 of Title 50 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotator relating to the Department of Economic Development. On the gentleman's motion that the rules of this House be temporarily suspended to allow a bill to be read for the first time and assigned to committee, is there objection? The chair hears none. It is so ordered. Ways and means. Okay, if um, we have several announcements, we have several announcements. Chair recognizes the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Chairman England, for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just want to reiterate that uh, the subcommittees will begin a meeting immediately. 
And to my fellow chairman in the house, I apologize that it may prolong your meetings a little bit, but we're gonna try to do our work as fast as possible in subcommittees so your members will get there as soon as possible as they can get, uh, get their stuff out. But I will ask the members of the committee, please be waiting in the wings at 341 because we're gonna roll through to try to catch back up to our, our original schedule. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Carter for an announcement. Chairman Carter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The full Governmental Affairs Committee will meet immediately upon adjournment in 606. Tomorrow morning, subcommittee meetings will begin at 830, which is a time change in the same room, 606. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Benton for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, State Highway Subcommittee of the Transportation Committee will meet today at 4 o'clock, room 515 CLOB. Chair recognizes Chairman Dixon for an announcement. Dixon. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Members of the uh, Education Appropriations Subcommittee, please meet in 341, 20 minutes after uh, we adjourn so that we'll be ready when our turn comes up. That's 20 minutes after adjournment. Chair recognizes Chairman Nix for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, House Education Subcommittee on Academic Support will meet immediately upon adjournment uh, in room 415 CLOB, and we're taking up House Bill 897 immediately on adjournment. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Cooper for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Health and Human Services Committee will meet upon adjournment, and we have a room change. We will be meeting in room 506 of the CLOB. That's human, uh, the Health and Human Services in room 506. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Chokas for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Appropriations Higher Ed Subcommittee will meet briefly upon adjournment in room 341. Higher Education Appropriations 341, briefly. Thank you. Chair recognizes Chairman Jacobs for an announcement. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Jacobs Subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee have been scheduled to meet today. Um, from 1 to 3, that meeting is obviously canceled and will be rescheduled, but we will not be meeting today. Chair recognizes Chairman McCall for an announcement. A couple of cancellations. Uh, Wednesday morning, Georgia Green Industry Association breakfast is canceled, and also tomorrow, Farm Bureau Day is canceled. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Pack for an announcement. The PAC subcommittee of the Judiciary Non-Civil Committee will be meeting today immediately upon adjournment. Uh, we have two bills. I don't anticipate taking so long. And also the Gwinnett delegation meeting that was scheduled immediately upon adjournment will not meet today. It's canceled. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Harden for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Resource Management Subcommittee of Natural Resources and Environment will meet at immediately upon adjournment in room 403 of the Capitol. Chair recognizes Representative Dickey for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Georgia Electric Membership Corporation reception at the uh, depot tonight is canceled. Hopefully it'll be rescheduled. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Taylor for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to announce that the Subcommittee on Health from the Insurance uh, Committee is canceled. We will reschedule. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Williams for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Black History Program that the National uh, Council of Negro Women, uh, it has been canceled. Chair recognizes Chairman Allen Powell for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Regulated Industry Subcommittee on Alcohol and Tobacco will meet immediately upon adjournment in LOB 515. 
That completes our announcements. That completes our announcements. Let me remind you, keep those iPhones and Blackberries handy just in case you get a, some updated information. Chair recognize, uh, Chair recognizes the majority leader for a motion. Mr. Speaker, I move that we now stand in recess until 5 p.m. today, at which time we shall adjourn until 10 a.m. Tuesday morning, February 11, 2014. On the motion of the majority leader that this House be in recess until 5 o'clock p.m., at which time we will stand adjourned until 10 o'clock a.m. Tuesday, February 11. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. We will be in recess until 5 o'clock p.m. Then we will be adjourned until Tuesday, February 11 at 10 a.m.